Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a good, great, a great weekend. Sorry. Um, I hope you're having a great weekend. If you didn't come to um, our book club, that's okay. We're just trying to read uh, from chapters one through five. And if you didn't get the book, I'm leaving the book so you can read it on your own too. You don't have to listen to me. And if you didn't get the book, go get it. The office is open from 10 to 1 at the side window. Just tell Miss Rosie or whoever's at the uh, window that, hi, I'm here for the book club. Miss Chavez told me to come and get the Tiger Rising. And if you're missing anything or if something happens, let me know. Just send me a message. All right. So anyway, howdy. Uh, this is The Tiger Rising fra by Kate DiCamillo. And uh, if you hear any noise in the background, it is my dog, probably Honey. All right. So here we go. And if you come to class, I mean, if you come to our meeting, you'll hear this. We have we were listening to this man read it with the southern drawl. I'm not that good, but I'll try. All right, and it's for her brother. Uh, when you get the book, check this out. She just says, I am grateful to Matt Pungshin, I don't know, uh, for giving me the music, Bill Molliker for always reading, uh, and McKnight Foundation for bestowing a pay peace of mind, Jane Rash, Thomas for uh, shining a light on the path, Tracy Bailey and Lisa Beck for being my... Uh, death of the hired man friend and my mother for telling me not to give up and to Carla LaRue for believing that I could and that I can and that I will. So when you write a book, you get to put down anything you want um, in the front. So this is kind of a dedication. So when you write a book, make sure you put your dedication. Don't forget your teacher. You can always dedicate one to me. All right. Chapter one. That morning, after he discovered the tiger, Rob went and stood under the Kentucky Star Motel sign and waited for the school bus just like it was any other day. The Kentucky Star sign was composed of yellow neon stars that rose and fell over a piece of blue neon in the shape of the state of Kentucky. Rob liked the sign. He harbored a dim but abiding notion that it would bring him good luck. Finding the tiger had been luck. He knew that. He had been out in the woods behind the Kentucky Star Motel, way out in the woods, not really looking for anything, just wandering, hoping that maybe he would be lo get lost and get eaten by a bear and not have to go to school ever again. That's when he saw the Bo oh, Beauchamp's gas station building, all boarded up and tumbling down. Next to it, there was a cage, and inside the cage, unbelievably, there was a tiger, a real-life, very large tiger, pacing back and forth. Let's see if I can get out of the way. He was orange and gold and so bright, it was like staring at the sun itself, angry, angry and trapped in a cage. It was early morning, and it looked like it might rain. It had been raining every day for almost two weeks. The sky was gray, and the air was thick and still. Fog was hugging the ground. To Rob, it seemed as if the tiger was some magic trick rising out from the mist. He was so astounded by his discovery, so amazed, that he stood and stared. But only for a minute. He was afraid to look at the tiger for too long, afraid the tiger would disappear. He stared, and then he turned and ran back to the woods towards the Kentucky Star. And the whole way home, while he was brain-doubted what he had seen, his heart beat out the truth to him. Tiger, tiger, tiger. That was what Rob thought about as he stood beneath the Kentucky Star sign and waited for the bus. The tiger, he did not think about the rash on his legs, the itchy red blisters that snaked their way into his shoes. His father said that it would be less likely to itch if he didn't think about it. And he did not think about his mother. He hadn't thought about her since the morning of the funeral, the morning he couldn't stop crying, the great heaving sobs that made his chest and stomach hurt. His father watched, watching him, standing beside him, had started to cry too. They were both dressed up in suits that day. His father's suit was too small, and when he slapped Rob on the back to make him stop crying, he ripped a hole beneath the arms of his jacket. There ain't no point in crying, his father had said afterwards. Crying ain't going to bring her back. 
It had been six months since that day, six months since he and his father had moved to Jackson, uh, from Jacksonville to Lister, and Rob had, cried, had not cried since, not once. The final thing he did not think about that morning was getting onto the bus. He specifically did not think about Norton and Billy Threemonger waiting for him like a chained and starved guard dogs eager to attack. Rob had a way of not thinking about things. He imagined himself as a suitcase that was too full, like the one that he had packed when they had left Jacksonville after the funeral. He made all his feelings go inside the suitcase. He stuffed them in tight and then sat on the suitcase and locked it shut. That was the way he not thought about things. Sometimes it was hard to keep the suitcase shut, but now he had something to put on top of it, the tiger. So he waited for the bus under the Kentucky star sign, and as first drops of rain fell from the sullen sky, Rob imagined the tiger on top of his suitcase, blinking his golden eyes, sitting proud and strong, unaffected by all the not thoughts inside the straining to come out. Looky here, said Norton Threemonger, as soon as Rob stepped onto the school bus. It's the Kentucky Star. How did it feel to be a star? Norton stood at the center of the aisle, blocking Rob's path. Rob shrugged. Oh, he don't know, Norton called to his brother. Hey, Billy, he don't know what it's like to be a star. Rob slipped past Norton. He walked all the way to the back of the bus and sat down in the last seat. Hey, said Billy Threemonger, you know what? This ain't Kentucky, this is Florida. He followed Rob and sat down right next to him. He pushed his face so close to Rob he could smell his breath. It was bad breath. It smelled like metallic and rotten. You ain't a Kentucky star, Billy said, his eyes glowing under the brim of his John Deere cap. And you sure ain't a star here in Florida. You ain't a star nowhere. Okay, said Rob. Billy shoved him hard, and then Norton came swaggering back and leaned over and Billy and grabbed a hold of Rob's hair and put his hand with the other hand, ground his knuckles into Rob's scalp. Rob sat there and took it. If he fought back, it lasted longer. If he didn't fight back, sometimes they got bored and left him alone. They were the only three on the bus until it got into town, and Mr. Nelson, the driver, pretended like he didn't know what was going on. He drove, staring straight ahead, whistling songs that didn't have any melody. Rob was on his own, and he knew it. He's got that creeping crud all over him, said Billy. He pointed at Rob's legs. Look! He said to Norton, ain't it gross? Uh-huh, said Norton. He was concentrating on grinding his knuckle into Rob's head. It hurt, but Rob didn't cry. He never cried. He was a pro at not crying. He was the best non-crier in the world. It drove the Norton and Billy Thermonger wild, and today Rob had an extra power of the tiger. All he had to do was think about it, and he knew there was no way he could cry, not ever. They were still out in the country, only halfway into town, when the bus lurched to a stop. This was such a surprising development to have a bus stop halfway through its route, and Norton stopped grounding his knuckles in Rob's scalp, and Billy stopped punching Rob in the arm. Hey, Mr. Nelson, Norton shouted, what you doing? This ain't a stop, Mr. Nelson, Billy called out helpfully, but Mr. Nelson ignored them. He kept whistling his non-song as he swung open the bus door, and while the Norton and Billy Rob, Billy and Rob watched, open-mouthed and silent, a girl with yellow hair and a pink lacy dress walked up the steps and on to the bus. Chapter 3 Nobody wore pink lacy dresses to school. Nobody. Even Rob knew that. He held his breath as he watched the girl walk down the aisle of the bus. Here was somebody even stranger than he was. He was sure. Hey, Norton called this. This is a school bus. I know it, the girl said. Her voice was gravelly and deep, and the words sounded 
clipped and strange, like she had stamping each one of them out with the with the cookie cutter. You're all dressed up to go to a party, Billy said. This ain't the party bus, he elbowed Rob in the ribs. Ha, huh, Norton laughed. He gave Rob a friendly thud on the head. The girl stood in the center of the aisle, swaying at the movement of the bus. She stared at them. It's not my fault you don't have good clothes, she said finally. She sat down and put her back to them. Hey, said Norton, we're sorry. We didn't mean nothing. Hey, he said again, what's your name? The girl turned and looked at them. She had a sharp nose and a sharp chin and black, black eyes. Sistine, she said. Sistine, hooted Billy. What kind of stupid name is that? Like the chapel, she said slowly, making each word clear and strong. Rob stared at her, amazed. What are you looking at, she said to him. Rob shook his head. Yes, yeah, said Norton. He cuffed Rob in the ear. What are you staring at, disease boy? Come on, he said to Billy. And together they swaggered up the aisle of the bus and sat in the seat behind the new girl. They whispered things to her, but Rob couldn't hear what they were saying. He thought about the Sistine Chapel that he had seen in a, uh, a picture of in a big art book that Mr. Dupree kept on a small shelf behind the desk in the library. The pages of the book were si slick and shiny, and each picture made Rob feel cool and sweet inside, like a drink of water on a hot day. Mrs. Dupree let Rob look at the book because he was quiet and good in the library it was his reward to him. it was a re her reward to him in the book the picture from the ceiling of the sistine chapel showed god reaching out and touching adam it was like they were playing a game of tag like god was making adam it it was a beautiful picture Rob looked out the window at the gray rain and the gray sky and the gray highway and he thought about the tiger and he thought about God and Adam and he thought about Sistine. He did not think about the rash. He did not think about his mother and he did not think about the Norton, Norton and Billy Threemonger. He kept his suitcase closed. Chapter 4 Sistine was in Rob's sixth grade homeroom class. Mrs. Soames made her stand up and introduce herself. My name, she said with a gravelly voice, is Sistine Bailey. She stood up at the front she stood at the front of the room in her pink dress, and all the kids stared at her with their mouths as if she had stepped off a spaceship with another from another planet. Rob looked down his desk. He knew now to stare at he knew not to stare at her. She started working on his drawing of the tiger. What a lovely name, said Miss Soames. Thank you, said Sistine. Patrice Watkins, who sat in front of Rob, snorted, then giggled, and then covered her mouth. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Sistine said, home of the Liberty Bell, and I hate the South because the people in it are ignorant and I'm not staying here in Lister. My father is coming to get me next week. She, she looked around the room defiantly. Well, said Mrs. Soames, thank you very much for introducing yourself, Sistine Bailey. You may take your seat before you put your foot in your mouth any further. The whole class laughed at that, and Rob looked up. Just as Sistine sat down, she glared at him. Then she stuck her tongue out at him. Him! He shook his head and went back to his drawing. He sketched out the tiger, but what he wanted to do was whittle it in, with, in wood. His mother had shown him how to whittle, how to take a piece of wood and make it some, come alive. She taught him. She taught him when she was sick. He sat on the edge of her bed and watched her tiny white hands closely. Don't jiggle the, that bed, his father said. Your mama's in a lot of pain. He ain't hurting me, Robert, his mother had said. Don't get all tired out with the wood, his father said. It's all right, his mother said. 
I'm just teaching Rob something, some things I know. But she said she didn't have to teach him much. His mother told him he already knew what to do. His hands knew. That's what she said. Rob said the the teach Rob said the teacher, I need you to go to the principal's office. Rob didn't hear her. He was working on the tiger, trying to remember what his eyes looked like. Robert, Mrs. Soman said. Robert Horton. Rob looked up. Robert was his father's name. Robert was what his mother had called his father. Mr. Felmer wants to see you in the office. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am, said Rob. He got up and took his picture of the tiger and folded it up and put it in his back pocket of his shorts. On his way out the classroom, Jason Odermere tripped him and, and said, See you later, retard. And Sistine looked up at him with her, her tiny black eyes. She shot him a look of pure hate. Chapter 5 the principal's office was small and dark and smelled like pipe tobacco. The secretary looked up at Rob when he walked in. Go right on back, she said, nodding her big blonde head of hair. He's waiting for you. Rob and Mr. Felmer, when Rob, Rob, said Mr. Felmer, when Rob stepped into his office. Yes, sir, said Rob. Have a seat. Mr. Felmer said, waving his hand at the orange plastic chair in front of his desk. Rob sat down. Mr. Felmer cleared his throat, <clears throat> and he patted, um, he patted a piece of hair that he had combed over his bald head. He cleared his throat again. <clears throat> Rob, we're a bit worried, he finally said. Rob nodded. This was how Mr. Felmer began all his talks with Rob. He had always worried, worried that Rob did not interact with the other students, worried that he did not communicate, worried that he wasn't doing well in any way at school. It's about your uh, legs. Uh, yes, your legs. Uh, have you been putting on them, that medicine on them? Yes, sir, said Rob. He didn't look at Mr. Felmer. He stared instead at the panel wall behind the principal's head. It was covered with astonishing arrays of frayed pieces of paper, certificates and diplomas and thank you letters. May I a uh, look, said Mr. Felmer. He got up from his chair, came halfway around the desk, and stared at Rob's legs. Well, sir, he said after a minute. He went back behind his desk and sat down, and he nodded his hands. He folded his hands together and cracked his knuckles. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Here is the situation, Rob. Some of the parents, uh, I won't mention any names, are worried that what you've got there might be contagious. Contagious meaning something that other students could possibly catch. Mr. Felmer cleared his throat again. <clears throat> he stared at Rob. Tell me the truth, son, he said. Have you been using that medicine you told me about, the stuff the doctor in Jacksonville gave you? Have you been putting that on? Yes, sir, said Rob. Well, said Mr. Felmer, let me tell you what I think. Let me be up front and honest with you. I think it might be a good idea if you had to stay home for a few days. What we'll do is just give you the, that old medicine more of a chance to kick in. Let it start working its magic on you. And then we'll have you come back to school when your legs have cleared up. What do you think about that plan? Rob stared down at his legs. He felt the picture of the tiger burning his pocket. He concentrated on keeping his heart from singing out loud with joy. Yes, sir, he said slowly. That would be all right. That's right, said Mr. Filmer. I thought you would think it was a good plan. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just write your parents, I mean your father, a note and tell him what's what. He can give me a call if he wants. We can talk about it. Yes, sir, said Rob again. He kept his head down. He was afraid to look up. 
Mr. Felmer cleared his throat and scratched his head and adjusted the piece, his piece of hair and then started to write. When he was done, he handed the note to Rob. Rob took it, and when he was outside the principal's office, he folded the piece of paper and carefully put it in his back pocket with the drawing of the tiger. And then finally he smiled. He smiled because he knew something Mr. Felmer did not know. He knew that his legs would never clear up. He was free. Okay, and then our next chapter is six, so I'm not going to go there. But um, if you want to keep reading, you can if you get the book. If you need anything, just send me a message in the, in the chat. We will be meeting again this Friday at 1.30, okay? So I uh, hope you had a great weekend and have a great week. Um, I'll see you later. Bye.